Hello and welcome to Gradiology. So you wanna learn how to read a head CT? You've come to the right place. We're gonna cover it from beginning to end right now. Hi, I'm Ian Gray and welcome to Gradiology. Today, we're gonna to talk about how to read a head CT from beginning to end every cubic voxel. The reason that I'm gonna go through this is so that you can have a search pattern or a checklist, a mental checklist, so that you can look at every important thing on a head CT. There are a lot of reasons that people make mistakes whenever they're interpreting head CTs or any exam for that matter. Mostly it's interruptions and distracting things on the image. So what this does is this creates a backup system to help you become a better radiologist. Much like a pilot has a checklist, you're gonna have a search pattern and we're gonna begin it right now. I typically begin on the bone algorithm and I put it to a bone window. My bone window is 500, 3500. And uh, the first thing I, I tend to look at is the outside, trying to quickly dismiss things that could be unimportant. So I first look at the anterior skin surface. And I scroll down and I start to see here gauze. That tells me that there's probably a soft tissue injury and uh, that it's probably gonna be a traumatic uh, study with a frontal trauma. I keep scrolling down, I see soft tissue edema and a laceration and I keep going down. I start to see other things, but as I see other things, I ignore them because this is my pass for superficial skin and soft tissues. Then I look at the right lateral surface all the way up, then the dorsal surface, then the left lateral surface. Then I start to look at the flat parts of the skull. I start off with the frontal bone, then I come down to the right squamous temporal, then parietal bone, then the occipital bone, then the left squamous temporal and parietal bone. Then I look at the right zygomatic arch. I come up to the top or the orbital roof on the right, and I go orbital roof, right lateral orbital wall, orbital floor, medial orbital wall, up to the roof. Then I start at the left orbital roof, come down to the medial orbital wall, orbital floor, lateral orbital wall, and roof. Then I look at the left zygomatic arch. Then I will come up and I will look at the nasal bone and I will follow it down as far as I can go. Then I look at the paranasal sinuses, looking primarily for fluid, but uh, anything that might catch my interest will slow me down as we come down through the paranasal sinuses. Then I come back up and I go to the anterior skull base, checking out the orbital roofs, the plantum sphenoid alley. I look at the middle skull base, checking out the foramen ovale and spinosum. Then I'll look at the mastoid air cells. Uh, I typically start on the right and I go mastoid air cells, oscules, semicircular canals, carotid canal, jugular foramen. Then I go to the left uh, carotid canal, jugular foramen, uh, uh, vestibular cochlear complex, oscules, and mastoid air cells. Then once I've gone through those, I'll go to the posterior skull base, examining the foramen magnum and the craniocervical junction. Once I'm done with this study, I will then go to the axial head and I will look at it on a soft tissue window, which is 4,400 for me. I look at the skin, 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 looking at the front, right, posterior, and left. Then I look at the right globe, and I'm looking for the normal anatomy. I look at the right orbital contents, then the left globe, left orbital contents. I look at the bilateral pterygopalatine fat and bilateral maxillary, retromaxillary fat. If it goes down to include the peripharyngeal fat, I look at that too. Then I look at the uh, remaining facial soft tissues, and I'm looking primarily for symmetry, going down through the muscles of mastication and oropharynx. Then I look at the dorsal soft tissues, looking at the muscles in the cervical spine. Posteriorly, primarily I'm looking for good fat delineation to exclude edema. Then I'll go to a subdural window, which is a little bit wider than a brain window, so I'll use a 4200 and I look at the frontal lobe or the frontal lobe skull interface. Then I look at the right side, posterior, then the left side. 
Once I've gone through that, I will change the window to 4080. And the first place I look is the dependent lateral ventricles and the interpeduncular fossa in order to assess for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Then I'll look at the frontal lobes, the temporal lobes, and sometimes whenever uh, like I have a high index of suspicion, I'll go left temporal lobe, left parietal lobe, right parietal lobe, right temporal lobe. Then I'll look at the cerebellar hemispheres and follow them all the way up uh, along the occipital lobes to cover everything in the brain. Once I've done that, I'll come back down and I'll find the cervical cord. I'll go cervical cord, medulla, pons, peduncles, thalami. Then I'll do the basal ganglia and I'll follow those down to the supracellar cistern and the cella and paracellar structures. Once I've done that, I've pretty much excluded, uh, or I pretty much evaluated all regions of importance. Oftentimes, particularly if it's stroke, I'll use a very focused window, which is a 1535 window, pardon me, scratch that, 3515 window, uh, and I'm looking for loss of gray matter. Once I finished with this, I will then look at the sagittal head. Uh, I like to look at the bone, particularly the craniocervical junction. I'll look at the soft tissue window and examine the orbits. I find it easier to assess the globes on this window. Then I will look at the brain and primarily assess midline structures, uh, including the corpus callosum, the pituitary gland, the pons, and the craniocervical junction. We also do a coronal, which I find a valuable resource for further characterizing things that may be muddied by volume averaging. I typically tend to focus on the flat part of the skull brain interface anywhere I see it, including the high frontal and parietal convexities, the temporal lobes extending into the middle cranial fossa, and the frontal lobes as they overlie the orbits. Uh, once I've gone through everything, I have seen a whole head. Congratulations, you made it through. I know that it was a bit long, but whenever you're not actually saying everything out loud, it'll go a lot faster. What I would like for you to do is to watch this video again, but maybe at 1.2 speed, 1.6 speed, 1.8 speed, 2.0 speed. Just ramp it up until you feel like it's more of a real-time assessment of a head CT, and then go through it a number of times to help build that checklist of important places to look as you're reading a head CT. From there, what I want you to do is go out and read head CTs. The only way that we get good is by looking at lots and lots of images. And by going through this pattern, you're gonna see so many normal things and so many abnormal things. By looking at many, many studies, you're gonna easily discern normal from abnormal, and you're gonna be a great radiologist. I look forward to seeing you again in my future lectures where I'll cover other uh, imaging studies, but also anatomy, pathology, or anything you're interested in. If you'd like, please leave a comment and we'll uh, discuss things further in the future. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Bum, 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 bum.